and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Now, over the next half an hour on the show, we'll look into the national badminton arena, the performance of the Malaysian uh, badminton squad, what goes into talent development, and also the crucial issue of accountability. Who shoulders the responsibility when players face defeat on a global stage? Joining me on the show, we have Michelle Chai, who is the CEO of Petronas Academy Badminton Malaysia. Michelle, thank you for being on the show today. Before we get into all these really interesting issues about um, not just uh, performance, but talent developments as well, can you help me understand the, the landscape, the infrastructure, so to speak? That what, Where is the separation of power, the difference between uh, BAM, the Badminton Association of Malaysia, and ABM, the Academy Badminton Malaysia, which is now Petronas Academy Badminton Malaysia. Uh, could you explain where the separation is, the differences are? Well, thanks, Melissa, for having me here this evening. Um, so up until November 2022, uh, BAM is the governing body of uh, Badminton in Malaysia and hence is responsible for all areas of badminton. So that includes the regulatory aspects of it, that includes the development aspects, that include the high performance aspects of uh, badminton. So both development at the state as well as the uh, national level, as well as organization of um, various tournaments, uh, badminton tournaments in Malaysia at the national level. Um, in November 2022, um, the Council of uh, BM, which is the highest body, decision-making body in BM, decided that in order to have excellence or, or you know, to focus more on high performance, uh, we needed a separate entity uh, to just look into high performance badminton. Uh, hence, they created the ABM or the Academy Badminton Malaysia. And Petronas being uh, our major sponsor, um, therefore has its name on the ABM. So when the separation or the establishment of the ABM happened in November, the objective of the ABM is that it would only look after high, the high performance aspect of the sports. So that means the national junior squad, the national senior squad, as well as the organization of the Malaysia Open and the Malaysia Masters. So that then leaves the BAM to only look after the leg regulatory aspects and the organization of uh, national championships and state development um, projects or activities. Right. Do you think that was the right move to have that separation of power and the specification in areas of focus? Is that normally done in other countries as well? So I think uh, what... BM did here in November, I think it's uh, first in badminton. Um, however, I don't believe it's the first in other sports. So, for example, in football, you see it quite often. So, between amateur football which or the regulatory side of football, which is usually uh, bodies like the FAM or the FA England, for example. But then you also have a separate entity which looks after the high performance site or the commercial site of football, which is usually the Premier League or the MFL in this case in Malaysia. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's tackle the um, really difficult issue of accountability. I'm quite curious to know, in your opinion, who should be um, held to account uh, when players don't achieve the expected results? Who is held responsible and what steps are taken to address um, the, the shortcomings in performance? So I've always held that, um, you know, when a play, whether a player performs or not perform on court, it depends on various factors and various stakeholders. So one, of course, is the player themselves. And then two, you have the technical people, the coaches. And uh, thirdly, you also have people like us in the management. And fourthly, the support system of the athlete, which is the family, for example, and friends. Whether a player performs or not on court, on these several um, factors or stakeholders. So a player can train 100%, you know, with all the coaches, they are brilliant in the training, very skillful and all that, but it could perhaps be that, you know, um, from the management side, get the salary for the last six months. Um, mm. So if this is the case, 
Um, then of course, even though the players have put in everything, but you know, there's always at the back of their head, oh, how is my family? Uh, you know, so the well-being of the athlete is also important. So I think if it's a case whereby player did his part, coaches did their part, but the management hasn't been able to pay the players their salary or the management didn't provide enough sports science support or um, we didn't provide the players with a good quality coach or a good quality training facility, then I think, yes, I think management is held, should be held accountable. Mm. All right. Um, but, but, but on the other hand, you also have, you know, when all these are provided, um, then, of course, the question is, you know, the management cannot play for the player on court. So the on court is still the athlete. Uh, so ultimately, you know, a player performance, I think, I believe is largely due to the player. So we can only support, and which is why it's always the support system of the athlete. So we cannot be the athlete. So just as we, I think if you look now, whenever a player is successful, uh, everyone congratulates the player. And I think rightly so. Uh, because the player is responsible for his or her success. But similarly, um, then, you know, the same accountability should happen uh, when the player don't perform on court. So I think to your question as who should be held accountable, um, I believe it depends on uh, the reason, whether, how, you know, why the player has failed. Because each of us, the administrators, the coaches, the players, we all have a role to play uh, in a player's success. Mm. Michelle, who makes that determination of the reason? Because uh, from a player's perspective, they will say they left it all on the court. You know, they gave it their best. From the management's perspective, they will say, well, we did our best with the resources that we had. The coach will say that I, I put in, I did my role. So. No one wants to take the blame. So who will make that determination? And the fans from the outside, all we can see is the scoreboard. And, um, you know, the, so we don't know what happens behind um, the, the stadium doors. How do, how, who makes that determination of who's at fault when a player doesn't perform? Sure. So for, um, with the establishment of the ABM, so we have now set uh, quarterly review. So for example, in December, uh, we sat with the players as well as the coaches to determine the tournament plan from January to March, as well as the target from January to March. What is critical during this one-to-one -one session with the player and the coach is also we ask the players, okay, what else are you lacking also from our side? So for example, I can give you examples of some of the uh, challenges that players voice out during this session. Okay, but I need a little bit more uh, help in terms of my protein intake. Um, I need more input from the strength and conditioning coach because I feel my weakness is on my back and, you know, I'm not getting enough attention there. Um, so when players raise their concerns, so the management is responsible to address these concerns. Mm -hmm. And this is where if the... so. Then, so think about it. So then we go January, February, March, and April comes and we sit again. So of course, in April comes when we sit and we say to the player, ah, okay, but you know, you were supposed to go to the semifinal in this tournament, but you didn't. So then player would say to us, ah, okay, you know, I asked for a sports masseur to follow me to this tournament, but it wasn't given to me. Mm. So in that case, of course, it's the management's responsibility. Um, so I think the key to all this, I believe when you ask who makes the determination, I think it's a three-way uh, communication between the management, the coaches and the players. Mm. Uh, not, I, I believe we have moved from the traditional way whereby the athlete is at the bottom of the food chain, so to say, and they don't have a voice. I think nowadays, you know, athletes, uh, you know, we have young athletes who, are, who can speak for themselves, who can express what they want and what, or what is lacking. Uh, so I think it's really a three-party 
communication and, and partners in trying to make the best version of the athlete. Okay, all right. So I want to come to the issue of talent identification and uh, development, incubation and development. Um, how does um, uh, the governing bodies ensure that the talent pipeline is uh, always has a, a steady supply um, of players? And how do you ensure that you know that the expectation, the burden for performance is actually spread across the stable of players that we have? Um, so at the moment, uh, we depend on our state. So we organize, BAM organizes around uh, nine to 10 tournaments, national championships uh, every single year. And these are participated by players through the different state association. But then again, this tournament starts at the age of, let's say, under 12. So you imagine 10, 11 years old. So from there, uh, our national coaches go to those tournaments and they identify several players. But also every year we have a talent identification program whereby we invite athletes uh, down to the academy and, you know, we have a one-week trial selection and at the end of it, you know, names are put forward uh, to be, you know, uh, absorbed into the academy. So at the moment, that's, let me say, how we have done it. Um, Having said that, I think we have also identified, you know, there are obviously gaps or there are elements where we could do better. Um, for example, you know, if we look at the tournament structure and therefore, so tournament structure, the youngest is at 12 years old, which means the, the states start to identify them at 11. But really, um, the development of a player should happen at a much younger age. Uh, therefore, I think now we, one, we are beginning to understand that, okay, you know, we need to enhance or, or increase the scope of our stakeholders. So maybe we need to strengthen our clubs. Uh, just to give you an example, as I always say to people, you know, we need to be competitive with Chinese Taipei, with Thailand, with Indonesia, um, but if you, or Japan or Korea, but if you look, look at all these countries, uh, in Indonesia, for example, the amount of kids that are undergoing organized daily training in Jakarta alone is more than a thousand. But I may not be wrong in saying that in the entire Malaysia, we have maybe about the same number going for daily organized training. So the difference in numbers um, are quite quite significant um, and therefore if so you know it's like an iceberg right so we don't have a big <laughs> enough base right hence our it will or the the iceberg will tip over at some point so i think we so there are clubs in malaysia of course now even now but i think what we you know as the academy what we need to start looking at is how do we get everyone to work together in a collaborated way and in a uniform way so that you know we are all working towards the same objective in the same pyramid and not the mm -hmm. academy or the private academies and the private clubs doing their own thing because they are not part of the family at the moment so how can we incorporate them into this development pyramid in an organized way uh, that they can contribute systematically into our talent incubation so to follow up on that, Michelle, what is being done on that front on on streamlining all of this, um, all of this, all the efforts to create a talent pipeline for our shuttlers? So we are now um, thinking of the idea of uh, having a discussion with um, owners of badminton clubs, um, so that we can at least open the discussion and and you know, see how we can all be in the same line. So what do they need to, to be within us? And also, you know, what is our expectations of them? So I think the alignment of objectives and alignment of expectation, but that need to happen, uh, that can only happen if we all sit down uh, in the same table. So I think that's the first step um, that, so it's more a discussion and, and open door to way communication. I think that's one. Secondly, as well, is, um, you know, we often say we all need to develop uh, players, right? Mm -hmm. 
but what is the type of player that we want to develop? And that goes back to, so if we don't have an idea of the type of player that we want to produce, then potentially the selection of players could also be varied, let me say. So then, mm -hmm. you know, you like whatever it is, and then five years down the road or 10 years down the road, you think, oh yeah, but that's not the player that I want. So I think we are also starting now to, um, so we are potentially having a workshop uh, next month, uh, inviting ex-nationals to discuss what is a Malaysian badminton player? What is a Malaysian badminton singles player? And then if we get to define that, then we then work backwards to say, okay, if we, for example, for example, if we say, um, a successful badminton singles player need to be 180, 70 centimeters, as an example, right? right? So it will trickle down to how we select. Yeah. So, or if we say, um, you know, our players are not 170, Malaysian players are in general 165. And because they're 165, uh, they need to have better fit movement. So then, how do we translate that into the selection of players? But also, if we then are able to identify the traits of a the ultimate badminton player that we want, that can be um, given to the clubs, to the private clubs. So we all train in the same way. So uh, like what they say with Japanese badminton, Japanese badminton is like a factory. So they produce the same kind of, I mean, you know, the same the mold yes some... <laughs> so i think if we want malaysian badminton to be a factory and not to re just rely on you know the one or the two that mm. popped up along the way i think that's mm. some we need to think of the processes as being systematic um, and a conscious process okay Wonderful. Michelle, thank you for sharing some of these insights. Appreciate your time. Michelle Chai, CEO of Petronas Academy Badminton Malaysia. We're going to take a very quick break here and consider this. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Consider This, I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our look at the performance of the Malaysian badminton squad and who should be held to account when players don't achieve the expected results. Journalist Harish Dior joins me now. He's the co-founder and editor of the news site 2213. Harish, thank you for being on the show. Now, um, I want to ask you how you would characterise Malaysia's performance um, in the badminton international circuit in the past decade or so? Um, thank you for having me on the show. Now, of, I, I, I won't be able to um, recap a decade long within um, a minute, but I'll, I'll try and just sum it up by saying that we were there and um, clearly we, did, we, we, we don't have the um, palapis, so to speak, um, as in the... Uh, the people who will be able to fill in those big shoes that have been left behind. And today we are trying to find our footing to see where we can um, achieve that the kind of excellence that we've seen uh, throughout the decade. Having said that, and in a very quick fashion, I would like to add that badminton today is exciting simply because it's an open affair. Any player out there is capable of creating upsets, is capable of being a world champion. So that's the beauty of badminton today. No longer a single personality um, dominates the scene at this particular time. It was not the, your era where you had, you know, your Chong Wei and your Lin Dan and your Cheng Ho, yeah, and so forth and so on. So it's it's more open, um, more exciting. So yeah. Okay. All right. That, that's a really interesting point that you brought up. And thank you for, for that note. I want to ask you uh, what you think the approach should be to accountability. When players don't achieve the expected results, who should be held responsible, Harish? Look, sometimes we, we tend to overthink things. Um, at the end of the day, a player is there for a reason, to play. 
Melissa, if you don't perform at work, you're, you're at fault, correct? So, you know, and then your bosses will come and talk to you and go like, Melissa, what's wrong? You know, how can we assist? And then you push yourself, you motivate yourself and you take it to the next level. So yeah, they are players. Uh, they are professionals, all of them, regardless whether they are within the national stable or they are independent players outside the national stable. Regardless, they are players, they are professionals. And of course, at the end of the day, it, it boils down to their performance. Now, how can the ecosystem support them? Many ways. Uh, for example, you know, your your dietitian, your nutrition, to ensure that they've got the right sparring partners, enough exposure. Uh, so th things like that. Um, those are, are part and parcel. The, the other ingredients to make the the how should I say the nasi lemak more much more nicer here, yeah, so to speak. <laughs> but bottom line, the players are you know whatever they dish out on the uh, court is you know it, it boils down to them. They can have good days. They can have bad days. Uh, it really depends on when they're supposed to peak, when they're not supposed to peak. You can't be expecting them to peak all the time. So th these are calculations, mathematical calculations that must be taken into consideration. And at the end of the day, what is the ultimate goal? To be the number one week after week after week or to win a gold medal at the Olympics? To win the world championship? I, and I draw... Um, among the best um, athletes the country has seen. However, he's not won an Olympic gold medal. Um, he's not won a world championship title. Yeah. So well, what exactly are we searching for? What, what, what is the ultimate goal? Right. Okay. Well, on that note, um, as I understand it, the aim is for Malaysia to find that elusive Olympic gold medal, at least in, in badminton, because we've had uh, 11 medals so far. Or to you know to win the Thomas Cup again since we haven't won it in thirty years, Harish, what do you think needs to change for us to be able to to have a fighting chance? Say in the twenty twenty four Paris Games, do we have a fighting chance? I would say not really. I would say my best bet would actually be on cycling. That was the last thing I won. Badminton maybe. Um, you know, I mean, uh, our doubles, uh, men's doubles, they, they surprised us with the World Championship title. Uh, but like I said, badminton, the beauty of badminton today is that it's an open uh, it's an open season, you know, an open affair. Um, anyone is uh, capable of winning. So, uh, and that that's the beauty of sport. Now, going back to what you said about that drive or that, that, that motivation to win that elusive uh, gold medal. Now, I would like to ask you, uh, Melissa, don't you think that we are too fixated um, in that pursuit of hunting for gold that we forget what sports is really about? That we forget that the natural thing to do is to turn the country into a sporting nation first to get enough talents out there and then the gold medal will come naturally. What, what we're having right now and, and this discussion as well is very top heavy. We are not looking at the grassroots. Mm. We've, we've got a lot of talkers, but how many people are actually playing the sport, organizing the sport at the community level, at schools, at grassroots? So we are, we are always engineering that, that, um, um, that uh, you know, mathematical formula to find our elusive medal, but we are not looking at what's happening in our own backyard, what's happening in our homes. How many of us are active? So I think the, the, the conversation and the solution is to look, whatever happens between now and the next two Olympic cycles, so be it. But there must be a massive reset in the way we treat sports. First of all, it should be part of our life. It should be a lifestyle. And then your, you know, when you get people motivated, you get people excited about sports. Trust me, the world championship titles and the gold medals will come naturally. We won't be talking about one. We'll be talking about more than one. <laughs> On that note, Harish, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Harish Deal, co-founder and editor of the news site 2213, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.